and, and even at a time like this, I think that's why we feel so, um, you know, so just excited and, and we feel filled. And, and so this morning, <clears throat> we want to, this is not a highly programmed event, okay? It, it, it's just a, a time to still come together as a family. And um, it's a real privilege for me because um, uh, a good friend of mine, Dave Clark, who's been running around serving us um, and, and just doing anything all week long. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been friends for <coughs> 17 years and uh, it's, it's really fun to have a partner to, to work with uh, in helping to make the things that happen here take place. But Dave has some amazing uh, musical and worship gifts. And so this morning he's going to lead us in worship. And uh, so uh, let's... Uh, Say a prayer together. And we give this time to the Lord, and then we'll hear one more word from Dr. Perkins. And, and then we're going to serve and uh, come to the Lord's table and serve uh, communion together. Uh, close our time and give you all an opportunity to share maybe some of you that God has worked in your life in some special way. We'll have a chance to do that as well. So, Father in heaven, Señor, te alabamos, te damos gracias por este día, Señor. Nuevo. some songs this morning that are a little repetitive uh, they might be new maybe even some echo stuff so if you, if you can see the screens that's great if you can't I think it'll be easy enough we've come to worship this morning amen you know as I've thought about what from my perspective this morning should be about we've been challenged man we've been challenged this week we've been encouraged we've been taught but this morning I think we just need to stop and we need to let the Holy Spirit do whatever peaceful, graceful work he needs to do in our lives this morning. So I just want to encourage you. I, I want this morning, I want you to forget about, for just this maybe hour and a half, I want you to forget about all the instructions and all the stuff you got to go back to and what you're going to implement. And I want you to let the Holy Spirit just commune with you. Would you do that this morning? This song goes. We've come to worship.
love Psalm 145. I would, uh, I would encourage you to go back to your rooms, go somewhere this morning, and sometime today, and maybe just read it. But it has words in it like this. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is rich in love. I mean, it's just filled with verses like that. But in the midst of all that, it just simply says, forever and ever, I will sing. Would you sing this part with us? And every time we come around to it, would you be the choir this morning? It goes like this. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Forever and ever I will sing. Let's try that again.
want you to remain standing. My wife Paula is going to lead us this morning in a time of confession. Gracious Lord Jesus, as grain that was scattered on the hillside was gathered together and made into one loaf, so too we, your people, scattered throughout the world, are gathered together around your table and become one. As grapes grown in the field are gathered together and pressed into wine, so too are we drawn together and pressed by our times to share a common lot and are transformed into your life, blood for all. You'll respond with me with, reconcile us, O Christ, by your cross. Gracious Lord Jesus, across the barriers that divide race from race, reconcile, reconcile us, O Christ, by your cross. Across the barriers that divide rich from poor, Reconcile us, O Christ, by your cross. Across the barriers that divide people of different cultures, reconcile us, O Christ, by your cross. Across the barriers that divide Christians, reconcile us, O Christ, by your cross. Across the barriers that divide men and women, young and old, reconcile us, O Christ, by your cross. All of us, please. O oh Christ, by your cross, make us one in genuine love and mutual trust. Make us many in gifts and talents and vision. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Now receive the words of assurance. Christ is our peace. Those who are divided, Christ has made one. He has broken down the barriers of separation by his death and has built us up into one body with God. To all who repent and believe, he has promised reconciliation. So live as people reconciled. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is through the mercy of Christ that we receive his forgiveness, and it is through the mercy of Christ that we extend mercy. You are merciful to me. You are merciful to me. You are merciful to me, my Lord. You are merciful to me. Receive 
receive from him this morning. to me, my Lord. It's out of the mercy of God that we give him our hearts, that we give him ourselves, all of us. Use this time to do that afresh and anew this morning. Give yourself to your Lord and Savior. This is my desire. and we, oh gosh, it's just like, it's, it's, it's our, I was asking somebody last night, he says, this is, this is my people, this is my people, and that's how I feel this morning. But I go back home, and I get into the midst of it, and I realize real quick that I need these things that we're getting ready to sing. I need more love. I need more power. I need more faith, and I need more passion. I want that to be your prayer this morning. More love, more power, more of you in my life. More love, more power, more of you in my life. And I will worship, and I will worship. 
worship you with all of my heart and I will worship you with all of my mind and I will worship you with all of my strength for you are my Lord more love, more power more love more power more of you in my life more love more power more of you in my life and I will worship I will worship you with all of There are two passages I want to look at this morning. I usually don't do that, look at two passages at the same time. Um, the Revelation, I want to look at Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 and um, verse 9 there through uh, verse 12. And my teaching this morning is going to be from... Um, um, Isaiah chapter 6. Boy, this is the largest group 
that we've had on a Sunday morning in a long time. This, you know, we always can huddle in a small room, but this is a wonderful, wonderful group. I, I, Isaiah chapter 6 is where I'm going to do my teaching, but I want to read um, uh, Revelation chapter 7 there. I'm going to read that. As, um, and let me tell you what I got on my mind, what I want you to hear this morning. I really want you to, to begin to practice uh, hearing the voice of God, the voice of God, listening for the voice of God, uh, uh, meditate upon his day and night. Psalms 1 is one of my favorite songs. Blessed is the person that walketh not in the past as an unrighteous and all that, but sitting in the seat of his comfort. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law shall he meditate day and night. Then he says, they would be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruits in his season. The leaves will not wither, and whatsoever that person would do would prosper. And so he gives that. And, uh, and this tr question that people ask me more than any other question is, uh, how can I know the will of God for my life? And so if we can help hear people to hear the voice of God, Jesus told us to pray that his will would be done, that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. And so it seemed like that the will of God seemed to me like is to reflect the kingdom of God here on earth. That's the will of God, that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we need to know what is going on in heaven so we can know how to live down here on earth. And so the key then is to hear the voice of God so that he can lead us and so he can guide us and into all truth. And, and that's really the, the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit is to help us to hear the voice of God. Uh, the, the Word of God, the author of the Word of God, really as it revealed to us is the Spirit of God. And it's the Spirit of God that helps us to understand the Word of God. The Word of God came not of old by the will of men, but by holy men as they were led and as they listened to the Spirit of God in the society. And so that's the basic teaching. You know, I, 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 I heard today the Spirit of God can't get the Spirit of God is sovereign, of course, and the Spirit of God can do what he wants to do. But as I listen at the Spirit, as I listen to people talk about the, the Spirit of God, it's more for their own emotion. It's more for their own dignity. You know, it's more for their own display than really letting that Spirit lead us and guide us into truth and to make Jesus Christ real in our life. That's really the work of the Holy Spirit in, in, in our life. That's those are the first ones. So God can do what he want to do, you understand? So I'm not putting limits up on, up on God, but it seemed like the teaching of the word of God has to more to do with the spirit of God leading us into truth. And that word is truth. And the scripture came to us by the work of the spirit as he moved upon people and revealed that to us. And we can only know God really unless the spirit reveal him to us. And so that becomes very important. You know, I think our religion is becoming more folklore. I, I, I think that we done got away from looking at Jesus and listening at the teaching of the scripture. And we started to define what we want it to be. And we don't almost define what we want God to give us and do for us. And that's not the basic of Scripture. The basic of Scripture is that God comes in so that we can do his will. Lo, I come, as it is written in the volume of the book, to do thy will, O Lord, not my will. And it seems like that we have made Jesus our servant instead of we being his servant. In, in life, and so we got to go back to the Word of God, and give some attention to the to the to the Word of God. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want us to try to seek and we hear the Word of God, seek and we allow God to speak to us, and then we're going to go in the Bible and look at the way He spoke to others, and then that way we can sort of listen more carefully, so He can speak to us. To hear the Word of God is to get a vision from God. 
get a vision from God. And so we need a, a good understanding of where that vision is leading to. The, the vision is leading to that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done on earth as in heaven. So I, what I want to do then is go to the end first and look at the end and then go back then and look at uh, the mean to that end. And so let's go and look what the end looks like, and then we'll go back and look at the, how do we get to the end. And so let's go to that Revelation chapter 7 there and see can we listen. I'm going to read that, and it's going to move pretty fast here this morning. He said in chapter 9, this is a vision of, of heaven to the throne of God. This is a vision here. Begin at verse 9. This is like the, the end. This is what the church is planted here on earth to do. Uh, this is the work of the church to, to, to call out these people from among the people of the world, a people for his name. And here we are looking at those people now uh, in heaven. In verse 9, after this I behold, and lo, a great mother too, that's the church, a great mother too, which no one could number, of all nations, all kindred, and people. Tom, he's trying to make us understand. He's going into all these details here to let us understand that he have abandoned racism and bigotry based on race and ethnicity. Now, he haven't abandoned the ethnicity. There are going to be people there in the bodies that he gave them, yes. reflecting the bodies that he gave them. Yes. And so there's going to be this multitude of people from all nations, all races, and they're all going to be prepared. That's sort of the idea. That's sort of the idea of what he had. And the church's mission was to carry that out. Because he had reconciled them to each other. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And now he have done that. He have done that. He have done that. And they're all now, all of us, all of us of every race and every ethnicity, they are standing before the throne of God. Listen to what he said there. And after this I behold, and a Lord, great mother too, which no one can number, of all nations, kindred, People, tongue, you can't get no better than that. Can't make it no better than that. Don't make it no better than that. It means that they're all are there in all of their languages and all of their tongues and all of that. that. That's the way the church started. That's the way the church started. They were able to hear them. Every people was able to hear them in all their languages and all of their tongues. You see, there is no basis in the Bible for racism and bigotry. We got to erase, and we can erase that. This is a good time to do that. This is a wonderful time. Listen to that message last night. This is a wonderful time. And I sure don't want this new, uh, this new ethnic majority to become bigots and racists and do the same thing to other people that was done to us. Well, done to us. I don't want that to happen yeah. in our society. It could happen. And boy, we could have the greatest upheaval that this world has ever seen. And if we all try to get even for the way we've been hurt, we ought to want to be forgiven. We ought to want to be forgiven so we can live together in peace in, in the world. Oh, let me finish this. Finish this in the world. Listen to these people here. This is the end. And behold, uh, uh, behold, lo, a great mother too, and no man can number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongue, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. And they were singing and crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sat upon the throne and unto the Lamb. All belong to God. They are the ones who have carried it out here. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders. And the four beasts fell down before the throne on their face. That's these beasts that we're going to see in a few minutes. Worship him. 
saying, Amen. Blessed, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, might be unto our God. I like the way uh, the pastor spoke last night. I like what he said about the power is not in our gather together power. The power is in our humility, in our humility. The power is in our brokenness in, in the world. That's the way God uses his power. He uses his power. Jesus was powerful. He was powerful because he came and humbled himself even unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God now have exalted him and given him a name above every name, that is the name of Jesus, every knee shall, shall, shall bow for God. For God. And they, they worship him. This is what they were saying. They worship him, saying, Blessed, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And that's the vision that we are called to try to reflect here on earth. And then what I want to then do now is to look at uh, how God calls people and listen at the voice of God. And we really want to see whether or not God is, and we know this already, we ought to know that, that this God that called yesterday is the same God that calls today. And that he's a consistent God. And so we want to go to Isaiah. Now, if you're going to know who had the greatest vision of Jesus in terms of the prophets in the Old Testament, it was Isaiah. He got a vision. I mean, he turned the prophetic vision of God into music. Uh, music. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting father and the prince of peace this guy gets a clear vision from god and if you follow the life of jesus when he was here on earth jesus god himself incarnated he followed the teaching of isaiah up to the letter he followed when he got ready to open his bible when he got ready to to start his ministry he went to isaiah we call it isaiah 61 he said the spirit of the lord god is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news of the poor. And when he got ready to move and set up his headquarters for ministry, he said, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness would see a great light, and the people who sat in the shadow of death, uh, light has come. And that's Isaiah. And Isaiah, so Jesus sort of lived out his life in obedience to the word of God as it has been revealed to Isaiah. That makes it so important for us if Jesus followed the word of God, he says all things that was written has been fulfilled. Jesus said, I have lived out that which was written about me here on earth. And, and so if we're going to let this mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, then we've got to get into the word of God. And we've got to hear his voice. Hear his voice and be guided by his voice. And so let's listen then at the call of God. Uh, in Isaiah. We all know this story. It's a beautiful story. Uh, the great king is now dead. I won't go into all the details. The great king is now dead. He's been sick on his bed for probably 15 or so years. Uh, the, he was sick on his bed because uh, really he had disobeyed God. And God touched, he got lifted up in pride. I, boy, we, got to re well, we all got to watch that. Pride goes before destruction. I, I heard uh, Gorbachev say something, and, I, it can, and, and, and the news didn't pick it up very much. I don't know if I read it in Wall Street Journal or where. The news didn't pick it up so much, much because we hear noise today. We hear noise today when we watch the television and all that. We are, even when we read the newspaper, we hear everything is sort of negative. And so all we hear is noise. Gorbachev said, when President Ronald Reagan and I started to talk about detente, talking together and eliminating these nuclear weapons and all that thing so we could take some of this fear away from each other, 
Uh, we said that the world had been divided between us and them. That was the Cold War. Russia being a superpower, and we was, was a superpower. We were both superpowers. And we sort of divided the world up. That's sort of the way that sort of our President Roosevelt sort of met with them when they met over there. And they sort of divided the world up, uh, the East and the West. And that America would be in charge of its super people over here, and that they would be in charge of their super people over there. And, and they, it was told us two world powers. And he said that all we were doing was raising up, wasting our resources on weapons of mass destruction, meant all this money, and when we use them, we're going to uh, destroy the world. And so they started talking about it. They said, why don't we get together, and, and why don't we, uh, 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 we got the United Nations, we got the Charter, we, 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 Russia, have veto power, America have veto power, so we can we live together, and that we can become a member of the nations of the world and that we can become a nation working for peace in the world. And Gorbachev said, okay, they agreed to do it. They didn't know all the consequences going to be on that because it was tough on them because when those people got that freedom, when they went at it, <laughs> they went at it, went at it, and they split the Soviet Union. When they, we stayed together as a, as a people. And Gorbachev said, as soon as the walls came down, where well, we were supposed to then be equal nations in the world. He said, America stood up on top of the pile and said, now we are the last super power. They reneged. And now we're in this mess because we had to police the world. We had to police the world and wasting all of these resources calling ourselves policing the world in our society. We got to learn how to hear the voice of God. And we as God's people have got to learn how to communicate the voice of God. We must become the prophetic people of God. And we don't have much voice in our economic system, neither much voice in our political system. And they both is in trouble in our society. Oh, we're supposed to have a voice. We're supposed to be God's salt and God's light. We're supposed to be the prophetic people of God. And the people are supposed to hear us. And they hear us by the way we live. They hear us by the way we live. And say, so, okay, let's listen to the voice of God and see what happens. What the king is dead, the great king is dead. And now this young boy, he's probably a nephew of the king, and they probably training him to be a scribe, a record keeper. The Jewish people keep accurate records of things. You can read it in the Bible now. They are record keepers. And so he was, uh, he was being trained as one of the princes in the palace to be uh, a writer. And uh, this morning he was so sad, everybody's sad, and this man, this time he went into the temple of God. That's a good place to hear the voice of God. That's a good place to hear the voice of God. And he went into the temple, and everybody was grieved, probably on the seat that the king used to sit in when he went to worship. It was probably there, had, probably had a big black uh, uh, star in it, Star of David, probably had it sitting in that chair. And as he looked above the throne, he got a vision from God. He got a vision from God. And this is going to become the most concentrated, the most, this man is going to become the greatest visionary prophet in the Old Testament. We've already said that. He's going to get a vision from God. It's going to be a clear vision, clear vision. And he's going to live the rest of his life with that vision. It's just like the Apostle Paul did on that Damascus Road. He got a clear vision. He heard the voice of God. And he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? He said, I've called you to send you far away to the Gentiles, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. And Paul could say at the end of his life, I was not disobedient to that heavenly being. And so when God calls us, he calls us for life. He calls us to give our life to that vision. 
I meet people all the time. They got one book of proposals in their hand this week, and they're talking about what they're going to do, and I meet them six months from now. They got another hand of proposal, and this is what they're going to do. When God calls us, he calls us to come and die with him. Come and give our lives. Come and get a vision that's big enough to last out our lives. The last us out of life. And so we have to listen for all of this running from one thing to another. And God wants to give us a gift and a talent and a skill, and he wants to use that gift and that talent and that skill for the glory of God the rest of our lives. Dick, I was thinking about you the other morning when I met you. What can I do? Well, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? That's what he called you to do, to be faithful. To be faithful in what God has called you to do. And when you discover that, discover that, that call in life. And so let's look now at this call of God. We're going to do the teaching now from Isaiah chapter, chapter 6 here. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That's the vision. I saw also the Lord. Sitting upon a throne, he was high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. Above him stood these serpents, these beasts, each one having six wings. And every time you get a vision of the throne of God, you see these chairmen before God. They're there. Each one had six wings. With two wings, he covered his feet. With two wings, he covered his face, and with two wings, he did fly. And let's listen to him. And one of them cried one to another, and they were saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I'm a person of undone. I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the serpents unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongue from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. This is the calling of Isaiah in terms of the task that God was calling him to carry out. I want you to listen for the voice of God so you can find God's will for your life, and you can carry it out, and you can give your test to that. And so let's look what happened then as we hear uh, the call of God upon our life. Number one, what we see here, we see God in all of his glory before the throne. We see God in all of his glory. We see a little bit of the bigness of God. He's not a parochial God. He's not a denomination of God. He's, there's nothing wrong with being a part of a, a, a denomination if you see it as an administration to sort of help you get along. That's all right. But don't ever exalt that to think that's the best that God can do. God is the God of the He's not a parochial God. He's a God of the universe. He's not just an American God. He's a God of all the people of the world. Somebody had a little slogan. We used to have it right, uh, one of our guys. Nate made it. Nate made it. Nate made it. He said, uh, it said uh, uh, something like, God love other people's too. Like, they're like, they're like no, God is like, God bless America. And it said, the idea was that God bless other people's too. God bless us all. Yes, God bless America, and we ought to be grateful for that. But God blesses other people too, and God is the God of all the people of the earth. We need to recognize that. 
You know, that's one of the things that I find difficult. I find it so difficult. And it's in Americans' behavior. We can't hardly love two people at the same time, especially like two races at the same time. And if I said to somebody, I used to say to people all the time, you know, when I go to Israel, I, 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 go to, I like to go to church in Israel. When I go to Israel. And when I go to church, I go with the Palestine, the PLOs, because they're the Christians there. And when I go over there and I say, you know, I love the, uh, the PLO people. Those are the ones I wish it with. And they say, well, then the idea was you hate the Jews. I love the Jews. They were the one who bought my ticket. They the one who brought me over there. <laughs> I love them. You're a fool if you're not kind to your host when they're taking care of you. I don't have no trouble loving a Jew and an Arab at the same time. It ain't no problem with me. But we don't got this whole idea that we got to hate somebody and also love somebody else. That's the way the world is. You know, I, I, I've been watching that in the election. I've been watching that in the election. And when Obama and, and Miss Clinton was really in there finding out. And I liked them both. I liked them both. And everybody was trying to say, trying to hate her. I said, she, well, she, don't hate her. She's the next best thing. <laughs> She's the next best thing in there. Can't you see that? You know, you know, you know, I know I'm not ready to I hate her. Uh, naturally, you know, I wanted that our creed to be lived out one day that we would be one nation under God with liberty and justice for all, that one of these days we would not be just judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. I wanted to see the reality of that in my lifetime. So you know where I was going. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? But that didn't mean me going to hate Miss Clinton and going to hate uh, 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 Senator uh, McCain. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. This guy was a hero. He had almost given his life for his nation. He loved his country. I don't hate him. He's a hero. You understand? And that, so, so to love one, you don't have to turn around and hate the other. God says, love your enemies. Pray for them that persecute you. Do good to them that despitefully use you, that we might be the children of God uh, here on earth. And so we see God. You see, so we see a big God. We see a big God there. Uh, his, he, we see him in all of his glory. We see him in all of his power. When he speaks, the, the post in the temple moved at the voice of him that spoke. And his, this house was filled. And not only that, but the earth was filled with his glory. So we got a big God. And, you know, we can't put God in a box. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. You don't put God in your little old denomination of box. He won't fit into that. Because he's bigger than that. He's the God of the universe. That's we see God. Number two, when we see God, we see God clearly. We don't see ourselves as being overqualified. You know, I meet people today. I meet people today, and they are uh, like me. Some of them, but they're better than me. They are at least they are junior college dropout. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a third grade dropout. It, 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 but you, I meet these people, and they're talking about when you're trying to harm and get them to do something, they're overqualified. They're overqualified. When you see God, you ain't overqualified. You ain't overqualified. You see yourself clearly. We are all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own way. And so we see ourselves, the proper way to see ourselves is to see ourselves as undone. He says, I'm undone. I'm undone. That's number two. That's number two. Don't come to God. God resisted the proud. He gives his grace to the humble. Number three, we see that we can't really get help from our friend. We, we see that the help we need is not my mother, not my father. But the help that we need got to come from the Lord. We got to look on above the hills. <laughs> Our help don't come from the hills. Our help comes from the Lord. And so we see the people around us is undone. I mean, when we are getting a vision from God, we are getting a vision from God. And God is shining his light into our own heart, onto our own heart. And so we see ourselves and we see the people around us 
as sinners. Number four, we experience God's forgiving grace. It's on the basis of that experiencing of God's love for you. That's at the point of conversion. That's at the point of conversion. You are converted when you see the wretchedness of yourself. And then to see that this God still loves you and that he's coming after you. He's coming after you. What you got to say don't mean. The, the God is coming after him like the father of the prodigal son. The father of the prodigal son. The son had made up his mind that all that was wrong with him and all that he was going to say to his father when he got there to let him know that he was been in the pig pen and all of that and how much he loved his father and that the father didn't listen to none of that. The Father's love was waiting on him. And that's the way God, I imagine God the way I imagine God. I saw it in my life. The way I saw to imagine God is, God is looking at me when I'm straying from him and when I want to stray from him. And he's there pleading with me to come back. And he's there when I sin, really pleading, listening, got his eyes open, his ears open, and listen for me to confess my sin. If you confess your sin, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but when all point tempted like it we yet without sin, therefore we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and forgiveness of sin in the time of need. This God is concerned about me. That's the way I see God. I see God listening for me to walk before him and to confess my sin. And it's so hard to get people to confess their sins. And so consequently, we live as victims in the world. I go to prison, man. I can't find nobody who have done nothing in prison. <laughs> in prison, every, somebody else has caused everybody in prison to be in prison. And if it wouldn't have been for somebody else, I wouldn't have been here. And the best healing places I go, I like these steps. These steps, 12 steps, 7 steps, I like those steps. I like them all because the first step of healing is the problem of mind. The problem of mind. The people are going to be healed who said the problem of mind. And the people are going to be healed who said, who said, it's too big for me. It's too big for me. I need a bigger power. I need some outside help. <laughs> I need some help from God to, get to, to solve this problem. And so he come. Listen to what he says here. He experienced God's forgiving grace. They take the altar, take the tongues from the altar. Now, you know what happened is when you see yourself as God sees you, then God takes the initiative. Right now, right now, God takes the initiative. When he recognizes the situation, then God took the initiative. It's by grace. It's by grace you're saved. It's by, that's what ought to make you so grateful. That's why you ought to, oh, man. God came into my life, and I said to him, I said, God, we were the old Perkins because we were the bootleggers and gamblers in my neighborhood. We were these folks across the track. They called us old Perkins, old Perkins. And when I came to know Christ, I felt the pain of my past. I felt the pain of my own people. And I said, God. God, would you redeem my name? Would you redeem my name? Would you make me respectable in my community? Would you and I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that God, and God will save the uttermost. He saves us completely. He forgives us completely. And I and I from my sin. And we don't have to even be, I'm not saddled with my old sins of my forefathers. I'm not saddled with that. I've asked God to forgive me, forgive them, and forgive people. That's the essence of what it means to be a Christian, is to forgive the way God forgave. To have the, I don't think we understand the sinfulness of sin, and I don't think we understand God forgiving grace. 
God saved. If Ben Lighton, in the cave that he's in right now, if Ben Lighton would get on his knees and say, I've been wrong. I was wrong for engineering the blowing up of those Americans in the Trade Center. I'm wrong for sitting off this wall that is killing all these people in the world. And if he would fall on his knees before God and say to God, forgive me, he has met God's requirement. He has met God's refinement. If you confess our sins, he's faithful. And that he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we experience the forgiveness of sin. Now, listen to this, number five. We hear God's voice clearly. Listen now. What we've been hearing now has been sort of sound sort of sounds in the temple. We heard music in the temple. <laughs> We've heard other things in the temple. Now we are ready to hear the voice of God. Once your sin is forgiven, you can now hear God's voice. When Paul was in that ditch on that Damascus road, who are you, Lord? He said, Saul. God, the, the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you fighting against me? Why are you persecuting me? And Paul said, who are thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus. It, and Paul says in the book of uh, Philippians, Paul says there that there in that ditch, God put his arms around me. Here is this murder laying there in this ditch. Who are thou, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus who loves you. I'm Jesus who died for you. I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. <coughs> Paul cried out and said, Lord, what would you have me to do? God calls us. You know, I hear all these, every, almost every time I hear somebody say, God spoke to me, I hear this all the time. I'm really around with these people all the time in these churches, with these people talking all this food talk all the time. I have to live with that. <laughs> you, 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 you know, I said, I, I, God told me something this morning. God talked to me this morning. What did God say to me? God said he's going to give me a Cadillac. God said he's going to give me a sofa. I know how to get a Cadillac. God don't have to take no time to tell me that. <laughs> I know how to get a sofa, a couch. I know that. I, and now God said he's going to give me a husband. God, God, now I tell you how you get a husband. I can tell you how to get a husband. I know how I got Vera made. <laughs> you know, all of this gobble gob stuff we hear, and we are accusing God of doing that to us. Let's listen as I close here. Let's listen at the voice of God. Let's listen at the voice of God. You hear the voice of God clearly. Listen to what God says, and God's voice is consistent. God's voice is consistent. Let's listen, listen to the voice of God. Listen at the voice of God. Then I hear the voice of the Lord saying, he's not thinking to buy you no car. He's not thinking to look for you no husband. <laughs> that ain't what God is thinking to say now. I heard the voice of the Lord saying. Let's listen. I heard the voice of the Lord saying. Who will go for me? Who will go for me? That's consistent in God's voice. God's voice is going up and down the street, in the alley, in the marketplace, and God is saying the same thing. Who will go for me? Who will turn their life over to me? 
who will become my workman? Who will do my will here on earth? That my will would be done, that my kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. Who will go for me? Your response will determine what happens at that throne. Our works, our works for God will be tried. Most of this other stuff, this car and this other stuff he gave me is going to burn up. It's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. But those that turn souls to God, it's going to be pure gold, and it's going to be purified so it can shine forever and ever in the kingdom of God. Who will go for me? That's what God is saying. I wish we could do like Isaiah. I wish we could do like Isaiah. That little 14-year-old boy so laying there in the temple, and I can just see him there. As he hearing this voice of God, I'm sure that he's looking around in the temple now. He's waiting. To, he he, he feels that everybody's hearing his voice. He feels like God is speaking to everybody in that temple. And he's waiting on the big shots and all these other people. He's waiting on them to get up. And, and as they hear this voice, he's looking around. And here's a little bit of boy sitting there and saying, Here am I. Here am I. Here am I. You don't overlook me. You don't overlook me. God speaks to him and says, go. Go. And we are preaching about him this morning. We are preaching about the Jesus he saw. He revealed him to us. He showed Jesus to us. He was born. He was showed Jesus to us. So when you respond, that's all God wants to do. All God wants to do is respond to that boy and to say, here am I, here am I. I remember that Sunday morning, that Sunday morning, in that little homeless church in Pasadena, when God showed me that he loved me, and God called me to do his will. To do his will. I've made so many mistakes. I make them all the time. And you can't even hold me captive for my mistakes. Because I ask God to forgive me. I mean, don't go around and look at my record. You got to talk to me now. <laughs> you got to talk to me now. God, but I made a lot of mistakes. But I'm trying. I do not want to be disobedient to that heavenly vision. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for what you are doing in our nation. I thank you for these people here, Lord. The people who are doing your will, who are doing your will. And basically, these folks come here who are doing your will. I know that we want to know how to do it better. All of us want to know how to do it better. All of us got problems, Lord, and we come to you asking you to lead us and to guide us into the truth and help us that we can learn from each other. We need each other because you have gifted different people within the body with different skills and that we need those gifts and skills in our own life, Lord, so we are needy people. But, Lord, we are tempted to obey you. We want to carry out your work. We truly want your kingdom to come. We truly want your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray that you would Bless all of the people, but bless particularly these CCDA people who are going back into their neighborhoods, into their community, rescuing the perishing and caring for the dying and putting them into the arms of Jesus who can really love them, who can really squeeze them. Bless them. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. be something if uh, 
Sunday morning preaching was like that every Sunday, right? <laughs> Not to say anything bad about you pastors that are, <clears throat> you know, bringing it on Sunday, but uh, John, thank you so much for opening up your heart to us, and um, thank you. <clears throat> and, and thank you, Vera May, for putting up with him for all these years. <clears throat> You know that she's the one that him, sharpens him and refines him and breaks him and keeps him humble so he can do what he do. Well, I don't know about keeps him humble. <laughs> <laughs> you think I had to put up with him? You didn't have to, but you have. So, <clears throat> Well, um, this, after this great preaching, uh, we're going to take up an offering. But it's a different kind of offering. We're going to allow you to offer up your stories this morning, okay? What has God spoken to you this week? You know, I don't know. I, I, I got to believe that God has done something in the hearts of some of you that uh, you just say, God, uh, I want to offer you my thanks. Well, I want to offer you my, just my life again. I, I, maybe you came here tired. You came here maybe believing that uh, you didn't have anything to give or um Maybe you, you need to offer God a, a confession that uh, you actually believed you were overqualified, you know. And now you come and say, God, it's not because of my goodness or my gifts or talents. Those are gifts from you. It's my brokenness that you will use. So if you have a, I don't, do we have any other mics or is this, is this the only one we have? That's it. Oh, up there. Okay. But um, if you have something, just come on up here and, and we'll give you a chance to, Good morning. Um, I'm going to make this as, as brief as I can. My heart is so full. Uh, my name is Mary Bogan. I'm here uh, with my husband, Tommy Bogan, from Seattle, Washington. This is our first conference. And just a quick bio, because it's, it's, it's so important, is that uh, Reverend Perkins and Mrs. Perkins are very dear to our family. My grandfather's house was right across from the voice of Cal Calvary and this man is a man that on Saturday one Saturday evening we went across the street in Mendenhall Mississippi to uh, with our uh, uh, aunts and cousins and sat in these little chairs and I put my when Reverend Perkins taught us and it's the first time I heard John 316 and he says is anybody here who wants to give their life to Christ. And at the age of 15, I went up and put my hands in this man's hand to give my life to Christ. Except I, I thought when I got back and people found out that I had done that, I couldn't dance. And so I thought, okay, I didn't read the details. I don't want to do that <laughs> and all. And, um, and so I, I, I just said, you know, that's, no, I'm not, no, not, I couldn't miss out on James Brown. That just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> And so, uh, but little did I know, rolling the tape forward, I've just retired as a teaching leader of a Bible study fellowship after 11 years. And this year, God commanded me, compelled me to read Jeremiah. He said, you must read Jeremiah. And I knew I was coming to this conference because God has been prompting me that he had another assignment for Tommy and me. And I've been praying for us to do something together. And he said, you must read Jeremiah. And I spent the last three hours on the plane reading Jeremiah. And when I got to the conference and picked up my bag, there was Jeremiah. And Tommy and I asked people to pray for us in Seattle because we knew, we knew that we would be coming here and we would formally receive the, another commission. And God has brought me full circle. And we will be serving. We're coming back home to Mississippi to be used. And thanks to something Wayne said to my husband that penetrated our hearts. Through this conference, we have distinguished even further. I mean, I knew this through my own work with Bible Study Fellowship the difference between a volunteer and a servant. But through this conference, through you, 
you have so demonstrated that difference. And we are very much like when Mary, Gabrielle told Mary she was going to bring forth Jesus and she said, I am the Lord's servant. And I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you for just positioning Tommy and me to have the privilege of dying to self. If, I, if they would say, what was this conference like? I said, it was a death chamber. It was a death chamber. And I walk at it not deadly, but resurrected. And I just want to thank each of you because each of you gave us clarity. And it's nothing like clarity. And finally, I would say that last night with a friend, we were telling them what we feel so excited about this commission. And he looked at me and he says, it must be perfect peace to know why you were born. And I said, and you can have that peace too. And so I thank you. I thank each and every one of you for what you have given us this week. Okay. Thanks for, uh, for opening up your heart. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Bob Johnson. I'm from Sovereign Grace Community Church in uh, Mead Valley, California. And I'm uh, walking away from this conference. This is my first time to, to do this. And, and I'm walking away with such a conflicted heart right now that sometimes I want to be happy and sometimes I want to cry. And uh, we went on the Nehemiah tour last night and my heart is just so torn and broken right now. Uh, I just asked for prayer what I'm going to do when I, when I leave and I go back to California, what I can do to serve because uh, I have to serve now and um, just... Just prayer, please, because I'm just so conflicted right now. Uh, I never realized. I, I knew, but I didn't realize and see it up front what happens in our world. And um, I just have a little world that I live in that uh, is, has a, a very depressed and uneducated area, and they're unchurched. And we started a little church out there that's just going like gangbusters, but... There's so much more to do now, and, and I didn't realize that. And I just have really a conflicted heart. So just as you go back to your homes, just uh, just just pray that that uh, the, the Holy Spirit will give me what I need to have, and the Lord's will 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 be open for me to do what I need to do when I get back, because I really don't know what to do. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, over here. Let's go uh, back here with Adu here, and then Sister, you can come up here. Use this mic when he's done. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, this like this conference seems to be like uh, like a life changer for me because um, it's really been so tough, you know, doing ministry back in in Nigeria where the church doesn't seem to understand what it means to, to minister to the poor. And to see how churches and, and pastors and are trying to enrich themselves. And then the communities and the people around them are living in poverty and Young people are turning to prostitution and drugs just not because they want to do it, but just to survive. And the church pastors just close their eyes and and how difficult it is for us to get a church to work with us and support us in ministry. But coming here and you know hearing the testimonies of of people like John Parkins and Wayne Gordon and the challenges and that they faced when they started, you know, just left me with the resolve to go back and 
and just give everything that I have. Because it is a call to service. And it is a call to just invest in. I know that God, who has called, is able to keep and to provide him to go and not just engage the community, but also to engage the body of Christ and let the church understand God's heart for the poor. And so for me, I think it is a turnaround in my life and ministry, and I think it is a life changer. And I want to say thank you for everyone that made it possible for, for me, and I'm sure all the brethren from Africa to be here. It's really been, I've, there's so much love that I have seen here from the staff of CCDA, from different people that God has brought me, uh, brought into my life and ministry. And you guys are doing a great job out here. And I just hope that one day we're going to have something strong like this going on in Nigeria and in Africa where we, people who love the poor and who are serving the poor will come together and glorify God and worship him and encourage themselves and go out and serve the Lord. Keep doing the good work. I thank the Lord for being here on today. In the beginning of October, the Lord said to me, who would go and who would I send? And I kept saying, well, Lord, send me. And then the Lord said to me, listen to my voice. Hear the instructions of the Lord. And I kept getting up in the wee hours of the night, listening and waiting to hear from God. And God said, but the month of October is for you to hear instructions from me. And my pastor had told me about this conference back in April when I was anticipating. And I said, well, when I go to this conference, I'm going to know what to do because I, God has put me over the outreach ministry and the missions ministry. And I said, God, I don't want to do it my way, but I want to do it your way. And I just came back from a missions retreat on Friday. Friday, I went Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we left and came here on Monday. And I met people from all walks of the life, and God said, a multicultural church. And I said, Lord, what are you saying? He said, I'm looking for a people out of a people, a multicultural church. And I said, well, Lord, how do we do this? And when I came here and I saw all the people, and I heard everything that people were saying. And I said, Lord, I hear your voice. I'm listening to what you're saying. Because he said, except God build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Are we willing to hear what God is saying for each individual? Are we willing to shape lives? God said he birthed us in this world, in this ministry, in him to affect the people to bring about change, to love one another, because he said that is his true commandment. Go, make disciples. And I kept, you know, I was excited. I called my son last night, and I was sharing everything, because my son is a youth pastor. And I said, you know, God is going to do great things. But, you know, as I was sitting here, God said to um, Reverend John Perkins, you ran well. You've done what I said. And I said, well, Lord, I want to be like him. But God said, be like me. Yeah. We can't be like him. I can't be like you. He says, be like me, a living example. And because I'm, I'm saying, Lord, when I go back, how do I do this? He says, just be like me. And I thank the Lord for every face that I see. God's voice is going out. Because we see all ethnic groups, a multicultural church. That's what God said, a multicultural church. And I thank the Lord for him giving you a vision. And you held fast on that vision. You held on to the vision. As I sat there, the Lord said, you don't have to wait till you get to heaven. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. God is pleased. 
And as he give us the tools, as he used this great man of God that humbles himself, he's a humble man of God. That's how he got to the place he's at. And if you look at him now, he's still humble. But God is looking at us as a people to take that message and go forth with it because that's the man of God's prayer. Lord, you gave me a vision and I held fast. Who do I give it to? And the, the thing that God has given each of one of us that we came here, not just for a conference, but to effect, effect, effect our environment. I thank the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Yes. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Vanita Josie, and I'm from Nassau, Bahamas. And this is my first conference here to CCDA. And I am truly overwhelmed. I brought a few of our leaders from our church. We're from the Commonwealth Baptist Church in Nassau, where my husband pastors. And we've all been so touched by this conference. It's different from the conferences that we've attended. And I said, God, you know, you told us that you're going to do something new. And trust me, this is something new. When I can look and see what God has allowed us to experience this week, being with, I mean, brothers and sisters from all over the world who are sharing the love of God. And this is what touched me so much. I mean, if people do not care, they go out and they reach out. It's like the church that God wants to see, for us to reach out to the lost, to the downtrodden, to those who are, you know, unchurched, the poor. And this is what it's all about. We've done ministry, but we have not gotten to this level. And I ask God to continue to give us the strength to go on. We're going back to the Bahamas with a new zeal, a new enthusiasm to go out there and reach those people for God. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dean Morris, and I'm from Chicago. I'm... Um, I am the executive director of a community-based organization called Nobel Neighbors. Pretty much just has the mission of improving the quality of life for the people that live in the West Humboldt Park community of Chicago. But I want to offer up a thanks to God just for this week uh, being here at CCDA. Um, I think for me it's been a chance to actually uh, put into practice this whole week what we've been talking about, uh, peace and um, showing God's love to, to the poor and uh, walking in, in uh, showing mercy and walking humbly. Um, we had stayed, have been staying at the Hilton and uh, right across the street from there is a um, Burger King restaurant. I know when we've left out in the mornings, um, we went there just to have breakfast, but the first night coming here, Tuesday, um, uh, my, my friend who's joining me this, this week, uh, pointed out, he said, man, I wish I had a camera because there was a uh, homeless person who had his head down, but obviously he had a classified paper where he had circled. I guess he was trying, you know. And um, we had breakfast and I walked out, but um, I felt I missed the mark. And we came to the conference and we began to hear some of the teachings here of transforming the city and, and just reaching out. Uh, the second day, I had the opportunity um, to meet a man named Mitch, and he's sitting back there. Mitch, ho hold up your hand. And um, Mitch li is here from Miami, but uh, he's also homeless. But um, we have had a chance just to dialogue this whole week, and uh, even just him joining us here this Sunday. Um, so I think it's been, been good for me uh, just begin to put into practice, you know, just some of the things that we've been, been learning all this week. Now, I'm going back home to Chicago, as many of you are going back home to, to your respective places. But Mitch is here, and uh, I'd like you maybe afterwards just to meet him. He's a wonderful man. He's no stranger to the Word of God either. And uh, I think it would be a wonderful opportunity if, um, by some way of connecting, finding a ministry here in Miami that can work with him, because I see the man as a leader, being able to lead the others who are also homeless and bringing a message of hope to them as well. But um, thank you, um, Dr. Perkins, and for the CCDA um, ministry team here. It's been a great time. Thank you. Here's what we're going to do. 
the, these last uh, four will share, and then uh, Vera, uh, Vera May. We have one more. Okay, a couple more. Are you all okay with time? You go, you all okay? We're not going to go on forever. Okay, <laughs> we'll have time for that next year. But uh, I'm just trying to. That's right. Uh, we're, I'm taking your time. <laughs> go ahead. I'll say good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, I know JP is one, and we're one, I'm finna say. Because <laughs> I'm not, you never hear me around standing up talking and teaching the classes. Well, I'm a, I was a, I'm a children Bible teacher. I've been teaching good news clubs for 40, 50 years. And right now, I think, uh, the Lord is laying, laying up. It's saying to me, you might get, be able to teach some more, but my voice is leaving me. But that's not what I'm going to say. Look, many of you all don't know that a couple months ago, JP went through major surgery. And he almost didn't, wasn't here this year. He started going into a coma. And you know, you remember Bernie Mac went into a coma. He started going into a coma. He felt something was wrong. And he called Elizabeth about 3 o'clock in the morning before, while he was in his right, right from mine. And she ran over there to the hospital. And she was over there when all the nurses came in trying to keep him from going, going deep into a coma. He said he could hear, hear what they were saying, but he couldn't respond. Uh, I believe that God saved him, let him live for a reason. And this is one of the reasons. And so I just got off of that. I am not a speaker. So I'm a worker, so I, I won't say that today. Uh, we didn't say that we've been married 57 years. We have. <laughs> we have, we was father and mother of eight children, four boys and four girls. Our oldest son passed away, and we still have seven, and I'm thankful to the Lord. Um, and uh, and Vera May, um, maybe the Lord has continued to sustain you in your health for this very moment, so that we could tell you that we love you. So you could you could know that you know that yeah. So you know that we love you. Let's go ahead and share. And then, and then. My name is Lane. I'm a pastor of a white middle-class church in Walnut Creek, California, um, and I came here uh, feeling a little out of place and wanting just a lot of direction about how to do things, and, and God didn't do any of that. <laughs> um, what he did do is just kind of start plucking scales off my eyes again about just the simple message, I think, of loving God and all neighbors and how integrated that is. And how as churches we just need to share that message as pastors, I guess. Um, and then I just just confronted with some of my own sins, some that I'm aware of or was more aware of and some that I wasn't. Um, just this whole idea of what it means to be white and the privilege that that brings. And last night, just God just gently nailing me with... Uh, with the speaker's message, um, which was so, uh, so important, and realizing, you know, what would it mean for me to submit to someone of color? Um, and I don't know who that could be, but I'm pretty sure God's going to figure that out. <clears throat> There's a bunch of folks out here that could help you with that. <laughs> hey.
I'm not used to speaking in front of folks, but I've always felt, and I've been coming a whole number of years, and I always felt sort of intimidated because I don't do what all of you in this room do. And you've got great ministries, and I'm encouraged every time I hear them. And I was complaining to John and to Wayne, and I've said it before, that, you know, I don't do ministry. I don't live in the hood. I live in a nice house in the suburbs, actually in Wheaton, which is, well, you know, but, uh, uh, anyway. But I realized that the reality is that I do do ministry. And God has called me to different things than most of you. That and I've, I don't know, I've always known a personal relationship, which I've always had for years and years. But sometimes God doesn't seem all that personal. I mean, he's there, and he saved my soul and all of that. But I think I even feel a little closer for being here. Thanks, Phyllis. Good morning, y'all. How is everybody? Doing good? Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, this weekend has been amazing. Um, my name's Carmel Grace. I'm from Savannah, Georgia, uh, not too far. Um, and uh, I wanted to share with you just, I'm a journaler, uh, always writing something down. And uh, just some things that God put on my heart this weekend. Uh, just, and it's also been uh, influenced by a lot of the speakers and a lot of the workshops and just a lot of things that I've learned. So. This is just something that uh, has been on my heart. Will you not offer yourself today to the service of the King? Yourself redeemed by the Savior's blood to the feet of the Savior bring. Will you not offer yourself today while your body and soul are strong? You know not that God will spare your life and he may not spare it long. Will you not offer yourself today while it costs you something to give? A priceless gift may never be yours to offer again while you live. Will you not offer yourself today while the Savior needs your life? It may be that when you would join the ranks, it will be the end of strife. Will you not offer yourself today, today while there is yet light? For when you would gladly give up all, it may be eternal night. Um, so I just wanted to share that with all of you because maybe some of you are at that same place. and. That's a lot of what God's been putting on my heart, and I am so excited to share with you and God and say that um, my answer to that is yes, and I am just so excited and thankful to all of you for the wisdom and encouragement that I've received this weekend and um, just the extra oomph that it has given me to go back home and let God use me where I'm at, so thank you. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Mamie Snyder. I'm from Chicago. I came with the Student Leadership Program. So, um, <laughs> my youth pastor is Pastor Dave Clark and my other youth pastor is Michael Pickle. So when they told me about this whole Florida trip thing, the first thing that came to my mind, hey, hey, we're going to Florida. You know, it's going to be hot. So I was like, I was happy and I was excited. It was like, we went over the components and everything. So we got here and I was like, I was so excited. You know, I've been excited the whole time. And the most amazing part to me is when we got to meet the other teams and there wasn't that many of us. And I was like, well, I thought this was supposed to be like all teams or something. And they finally explained it to us. And I was like, okay, it's understandable. So they told us the kind of stuff we was going to be doing. So part of that was this reconciliation part. And we had to go into the community. No, it was listening to your community. And so we had to go out in like in the Miami area. They separated us into two groups. One in the upper class, the downtown area, and then Overtown, the like poverty part. So my group went to Overtown. So you know, I was still excited. I was like, yeah, hey, we get me new people. We get to Overtown. I was like, huh, okay. Like, you know, <laughs> this was funny, because I was excited, so we got there, and I was like, okay, we're looking at places, colorful houses. I was like, okay, I'm excited about this. So, 
we get there. We get out the bus. We go into this little organization place. It's like a youth group from over town. And she explains what they do or whatever about the community. So they're like, okay, now you guys could go. They separated us into red, yellow, and green. So red, pink, and green. It was pink, yellow, and green. So it was each different sections of Overtown. So my group was the yellow group. So we had like Third Street. And so the community went in. It was like, when you get, when you get here, there's a gate right here. It's dividing the area. And then you go in, there's this park and like these different sections and buildings and stuff. So we get in, and there's a lot of people in the park. The first person I go to is this older guy, because I was like, OK, the teenager's over there, but I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. So <laughs> I go and I talk to Mr. Cordell. That's the first person I spoke to. And like I remember his interview the most, and it's clearer to me, because he explained the whole thing to me. Like I went over there. I introduced myself. He was like, oh, I thought you was going to come talk to me kind of thing. I just thought you guys were walking through. And he's like, that how teenagers these days are afraid to like speak their mind and talk to people about their feelings and stuff. So I was sitting up there and I was like, can I interview you? He's like, yeah, sure. What do you want to know? And I was like, um, I have some questions about how you feel about your community. And the first thing he said was like, um, that's a big problem. But I guess we could start from somewhere. What questions do you have? And I was like, well, I have five questions. He's like, can I look at the questions first? And I was like, yes. So he looks at the questions and he handed the paper back to me. And he's like, did you ask yourself these questions? Or did you do this in your community? And I was like, yeah, I did it before because it was part of our youth group thing. We did this thing one time that we had to go out for this journalism program and ask the people in our community about like how they felt about certain things. So I was like, I did this with some of my friends and stuff like that. And like the things that happened in my community and we want to change, I want to know what you guys want to change in your community. So he told me, like, first he answered my questions, then he went in to tell me his life story. Like, he, as a teenager, he was a drug dealer. So he used to sell drugs to the teens on the street or whatever, not really thinking. But then, like, he got, there was this youth pastor or whatever, and he got called into the church. So he used to go to church, but because of his background and stuff, he wasn't able to get, like, a lot of jobs. So now he's a plumber. And he was like, um, that is hard because he's sitting here today, he could have been something better, he could have made himself better, like he could have been ministering to people, but instead he's a plumber and he's afraid to go out there and speak to people. And that really touched me because he's like, I'm glad that I see you guys out here because the kids around here aren't doing that, like they're just sitting around. So I moved on and I went to talk to some teens. And at first I was like, oh, like, you know, that's the hard part. Like my heart was beating because I'm so used to like, we re teens don't really communicate with each other. Like, everybody got their own cliques. So this is different territory. It's not Chicago no more. And I went up there, and it was like a group of girls and guys and stuff. It was all separated. But it was like only three girls in the park. So I was like, OK, I'm not going to go to the girls first, because they're looking at me like, mm. So I went to the guys first, and I was asking questions. And then like, I was talking to this one guy, and then all of a sudden, like, all the guys come over. So I was like, OK. So we're talking, and they're like, you're not from here, are you? And I was like, what is that supposed to mean? And they're like, you carry yourself differently. Like, there's something about you that's not the same, but so why are you here? So I told them, and they was like, where are you from? I'm like, Chicago. They're like, so why are you in here? Like, why are you over here? Or didn't you come to Miami, like, to go on vacation, to have fun? Why are you over here? And I was like, it was part of this assignment they gave us, but like, as we talk, like, I develop friendships with these people. Like, I realized that we have more in common. And it was like, it was amazing. We just spent the whole time talking. And I said that, like, for over an hour, we were just talking with different teens and stuff in my group. And we were just sitting there talking. We were supposed to in be interviewing other people, but we just couldn't get away from that spot. We were just sitting there talking. And it was like, one of the things they told me was that they were like a youth ministry group. Like, you know, they want the church to be more active in their communities. Because at school, they feel like they're nothing. At home, they feel like they're nothing. The only thing they could do is be out there doing drugs and stuff. They want something, like they want to be involved. And so I was sitting back there when they said, um, the type of offering we're giving today. And I'm tapping my feet. And I was like, I want to say it, but I don't want to say it. I want to go out there, but I don't want to go out there. And Ms. Don is like, do you, want, do you have something to say? And I was like, no. <laughs> I, I don't think that's true. <laughs> and she's like, are you sure you don't want to say nothing? And I'm like, 
No, I don't want to talk in front of all these people. So I'm still sitting back there tapping my feet, and you know, and then more people are coming up. So I'm like, God is like, Mamma, get up there. And I'm like, uh-uh. And he's like, Mamma, I said, get up there. And I'm like, uh-uh. So I'm still sitting there tapping my feet. So she, she looks at me, and I'm like, I'm like, I think I have something to say. So she's like, do you want to go up there? And I'm like, I don't know. And it's just like, are you sure you don't want to go up there? Like, go up there and say what you have to say. And I was like, I want to go up there, but I don't want to go up there. Like, I just think we should stay here. And she's like, do you want me to go with you? And I'm like, yes, it'll make me feel better. So we're coming up, and we're in the line. And I'm like, OK, so it's my turn. Two more people. And I'm still, like, tapping my feet. So it's like, and I came up here, and I didn't even know what I was going to say. But like, God already spoke. So that's all I have to say. Thank you.